Welcome to another episode of The Grail. This will be episode number 67. We have an incredibly interesting guest today. I know probably 99% of you that listen to this show go to concerts and comedy shows. And most likely by now, you've come across what is called the Yonder Bag. If you haven't come across this, so let me explain to you what it is. Performers these days... They prefer to perform in a phone-free venue. It's just a better fucking experience. The people are on board. The performer is on board. Everybody is engaged. And it is this experience like you were living in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, where you went to the show You didn't film the show. You weren't worried about the selfie. I told you I was there. Look how popular I am. You just went. And this yonder bag is basically, to me, one of the greatest inventions going as a performer, as a comedian who has put up thousands of hours on the stage and and had to deal with the person on the phone uh, and, and all different insanities of it, too. Not just texting, but actually answering calls mid-comedy show or playing video games or social media and, and completely not engaged to the show at all. And fucking up other people's experiences by, you know, every time a phone comes out, if you're in a movie theater or concert or whatever, now you're looking over at that person like, what is that fucking person doing? My point is, I'm a fan of the Yonder, and I wanted to know how it came about, who invented it, what is the history of the Yonder bag, and Graham Dugoni, CEO of Yonder, was kind enough to stop by and give me a little bit of history of the Yonder bag. This is a great episode. Love it or hate it, I'm telling you, I think we need it. I think we need to unplug a couple hours at a show or a movie or a concert or anything that you paid to see. So thank you for joining me and my uh, journey through the grail, finding all these fantastic guests. And I want to tell you this, please, would you please leave a review and subscribe on iTunes and also subscribe to my YouTube channel, Dean Del Rey. And if you want a bunch of bonus episodes of Let There Be Talk, join the Patreon. I'm putting out tons of content. I just bought some more equipment. I'm trying to get into more video world and clips and all that. Trying to make this show and the Let There Be Talk and CactusRadioNetwork.com the best I can make it. So join and subscribe. Spread the word. Don't forget the Grail has a shirt that's unbelievable. DeanDelRay.com. And I'm about to start that tour with Marcus King and Neil Francis, the Youngblood tour. All the tour dates are on DeanDelRay.com. So let's get into it. Number 67 of the Grail here. All right, here we are, another episode of The Grail. This is, this is going to be a very, very interesting episode because, you know, I travel, I do comedy, and the audience can sometimes be uh, not engaged. And I grew up in an era where there were no cell phones, and it was you and the audience. And I think in the comedy world, it really is the last of you and the audience because you're not allowed to just film comedians like when you go to concerts now everybody just has their phone out they're filming they're not engaged they never watch the shit later not Mm -hmm. quite sure what they're filming for um but along came a uh an invention or a, a, a a device whatever you call it um called the yonder bag and it had this love-hate thing. But me as a performer and as a uh, concert goer, I love it. And my guest today, introduce yourself. Graham Dagoni, CEO of Yonder. CEO of Yonder. Oh, there yeah. you go. Boom. Let's get into this, man. It, um, first of all, I am a big fan of it because I think that people are so addicted to their phones that they need to be forced not to have it. 
which is an interesting uh, thing, you know. You can't have phones in a Broadway play and you can't have them in comedy shows. Those are kind of the last two. People are in movie theaters. I go to movies, it's $15, $20 to see a movie. And I don't know where you guys live there, 15 20 but in LA, that's what it costs. And people fucking whip their phones out and just ruin it for everyone around them. They don't care. It lights up the room. Sometimes it's ringing or whatever. So at what point do you think of this idea and put it all into motion? Well, I guess it was probably around 2012, uh, start, I guess 10 years ago, that I was kind of looking around at the same stuff you're seeing. Because there's no etiquette, even now, there's really no etiquette around phone use. But in general, I think there's still not much etiquette about where the internet sits and related to privacy, related to performance spaces. It's somewhere like where smoking was on planes back in like the 70s, you know? It's not crazy different. So around then, I was just looking at, at that and trying to see, all right, where is this gonna, where is this gonna shake out? And at the time, I was living in San Francisco, and the narrative there is pretty straightforward. It's more tech everywhere all the time. And somewhere along that train is gonna be the solution to our problems. And I was looking at the same thing you see at shows in these different spaces and going, it didn't really make sense to me. I thought that certain spaces probably would be better served if they're kind of carved out as spaces people can go. And for all sorts of reasons, when you go to that space, what happens there stays there. It's a chance to step off the grid for a while. So that was kind of my point of departure, I guess. So you you start to think about it, and do you think, how can we do this? Do we force them to leave them in their cars? Do we search the people? Is there a box we can put them in? Is there a coat check slash phone check? What ideas are running through your head before you actually come up with a device? Because I think the main thing, people were like, wait a minute, and this is the main thing I always hear, You know, I got kids at home and stuff. Mm -hmm. And when I was growing up, you didn't know they were dead until you got home. (laughs) Yeah. And they died. You're like, well, I saw fucking Radiohead tonight. Kids died, but, you know. I was there. That's a a gory thought. But I'm just saying, at what point do you think of a device to put it in? Well, I kind of thought about it from all the different angles, I guess. And the most important thing for us is... A group and for me was i don't i see us as part of this emerging counterculture that's how i view our company and what yonder is is this group of um especially younger people who are looking to not live behind a screen all the time so the mechanism to do it you know you're talking about thirty thousand person arenas you're talking about small comedy clubs and and then all the schools we do which is the other half of what we do oh schools oh wow. yeah that's the other half of our business wow um but it had to be something simple i thought approachable um, because the message is really, it's not taking anything away from people. I hope it's, Hey, you're going to step into this phone free space for a while. It's what the artist would like. We think you're going to enjoy it more. And here's something that's super relatable. It goes in this pouch it locks. You keep it on you. You know, if you need to use it at the show, you can go to this phone use area again, really similar to a smoking section. Kind of. Yeah. But I thought it had to be something approachable and relatable and not it was kind of it would seem silly to me to do something super high tech to solve a problem that is being created by technology you know so i think from that base level and just going around and at the time i was uh, i had like 500 pouches in my car i was going to schools during the day and i'd hit like six or seven schools and then i'd go to every venue around the bay and i'd come down here to la and i'd do the same thing and i'd just been talking to enough people that i felt like all right this is something that people can wrap their head around that is that is the chance to work and then the rest was just trial and error well let's get into a little bit of the prototype so when you first start you're trying to figure out okay how do we lock a bag so they can't get in it i mean of course you got these fucking monsters that cut the bags open like idiots you know and throw Mm -hmm. them under their seat i'm like you are are you out of your mind yeah you don't take my right it's like oh my god it's so much so much insanity and um, just people think the whole world's around them, you know, but how do you figure out the perfect bag to use? Do you start with like some kind of sealant plastic bag or do you 
you know, you have an idea out of the gate what you want, and how do you figure out the technology of what you want, how the bag closes? Well, I guess in the early days, you know, it was just me sitting around in an apartment in San Francisco. I was like, all right, well, how do I go about, I have no business background. I know, you know, I played soccer in college, so I was an athlete, it was my background, but I was like, well, how do I get this thing going? How do I figure out what to do? So the first thing I did was I created like a fake business account on Alibaba. Yeah. And I started talking to manufacturers overseas. I was like, all right, well, you know, all right, what could close and open easily? What would that have to look like? And I was already imagining back then, I was like, all right, we're talking about tens of thousands of people coming in a door and leaving. So it has to be durable, it has to be simple, it has to be quick, it has to be quick and easy to lock and unlock. So that's where I started. And I started tinkering around with stuff. I would, I would get supplies, go to the hardware store, get a guy to help me. I'd cobble together something, send for shipping to go overseas, get something back that was wildly different than what I thought. I'd spend another week or two doing that. So the first prototypes all built that way. I kind of built them myself and sent them over until I got to this place where I thought I had a mechanism that could kind of work. At the time, it was this detachable two-part system. It was pretty janky, you know, and the, the unlocking bases were... Uh, I had a seamstress making and it was these magnets covered up with this fabric that she sewed and that was that was it um, and then from there I you know, got I think the first club I got to use it was this the stork club it was like a biker bar in the bay yeah and they let me use it for a burlesque show and the people hated it I mean bags were getting ripped apart but I was I was amped I was like this is great um, so from there I took the basics of like kind of the pin and that unlocking a magnetic seal. And I thought, all right, this is something that, that I can work with. And I, I went from there. The magnet is so strong. I mean, that is like the, I mean, it's a lock. So how do you find like a magnet that is that strong where the person can't open it? Oh, it's a, the, the internal mechanism is kind of, I mean, if you get into it, it's kind of interesting. It's a bunch of ball bearings that have just this forcing function against the pin. And, and then when you look for stuff that can unlock it, it there's, there's every type of magnet you can imagine out there. You, you get deeper into it. I've learned a lot. Um, but it, wasn't, it hasn't been crazy difficult. We take a combination of custom parts that we've made um, and off-the-shelf kind of stuff and, and morphed them together. But no one, you know, we've had to kind of figure it out as we go because no one else, it's, it's, there's no exact analog so it's just been trial and error. And now we're at a place where we've got a lot of different designs cooking and um, more to work with. But at the time, it was uh, I had one shot. And it was like, all right, let's see where this goes. From the first ones that you used at the store club, do, uh, are they completely different now? It's, I mean, it's very different. The, the only thing that's similar in a way is the material is still pretty similar because it's, it's durable. It's easy to clean. It stretches. You know, now people's phones. Back then, I had a small that was could fit a flip phone maybe a medium and a large and through you know just the evolution of phones and stuff now we only have the large size and uh and then you've got a bunch of wearable tech to stick in there too especially at schools you know kids have oh, phone, the earbuds, uh, watches. The watch, oh yeah the whole thing so the stretchy material is important and i, I you know of course at certain shows you're going to get ripped open bags and stuff but yeah at the end of the day that's that's okay for me. It's okay. It's more important that people are like, all right, I, I, I get the idea. I'm down with that. Um, that's kind of what holds it together. At what point do you get a good, uh, you know, amount of these and then approach somebody else after the store club? Where do you go next? I think the first, I mean, I was, I had a few schools that I got into kind of hop on board i done a few other little shows. I think that first show at the store club, some, some kind of random reporter happened to be there and wrote a story about it. But then I think, you know, I was doing door to door and doing that, I don't know, six, eight months. It really. was just you? Just me. Wow. And just kind of like, all right, well, something will shake loose. And I think the real things clicked over when it was probably 2015 or something. I was down in San Diego and I got a random call and it was someone from Dave's from Chappelle's team. Right. And um, he was just kind of kicking things back up again. And um, I got a call. So I flew up from San Diego to LA the next day, met with, uh, met with his team. Um, I was Cena, and he was going to do a run of shows out of Talia Hall in Chicago. We had probably talked for half an hour, maybe an hour. About two days later, me and a buddy flew out to Chicago, 
I had about every pouch we had at the time, and we did about an eight or nine day run. Whoa! And it was amazing. Met a ton of comedians. You, you, what an introduction to like to the comedy world, you know? It was just the two of you guys doing the phone, uh, putting them in the bags. Oh yeah, I mean, venue staff hopped in and helped out, and right. I think at that time there were a couple other people on the team too who were who were, we were, we were all kind of racing around, but that was it. Uh, so we did it, and then from there. I think actually I did a <laughs> somehow did like an exclusive or something interview with I can't remember who and and that that got a ton of press and I got calls from people at Live Nation and whoever and they're not super happy about it but that was it and then after that we kind of got started to get some momentum in schools and the rest has been building backwards to try to figure out you know how do we handle the logistics and grow with the the demand so you know it is funny because i remember dave was traveling with the underbags and you know he was doing them in arenas and everything and i was like that's amazing and i didn't know it was all the way back at 2015 that's crazy i thought this uh yonders were like around 17 you know 2017 mm -hmm. but i started seeing them uh they had them at the comedy store i i uh, for a couple people that shot specials there. Mm -hmm. And then I remember the punchline, I think, started using them and Sam Fram mm -hmm. and uh, the improv in Hollywood. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. Because what had happened is I had done a couple of uh, the comedy works, Wendy. And oh, yeah, she's yeah. awesome. Yeah. yeah, so she was like, we got yonder bags. And I remember going out to the Comedy Works and headlining all weekend. It was the first time I was in a, a full-on headlining situation where yonder bags were in effect. And the thing I noticed was the first set I did was an hour and 15 minutes. It was about 20 minutes longer than usual. And I realized why. People were engaged. I could do the bits longer. I didn't have to keep the gas mm -hmm. on to keep their faces looking at the stage and they were jokes were hitting so much harder because people were hearing the setups and later doing the callbacks that they heard everything yeah and i was like this is a must you know just in life in general just get away from your phone for a little while you you paid the ticket some tickets are like two three four thousand oh, dollars and yeah. they're filming the shows not even it, it's wild man and it also is a wild world to think about i grew up in the world where professional bootleggers would mm -hmm. build custom cassette recorders and tape them to their body and somehow maybe get in with a fake wheelchair or whatever, yeah. set up intricate fucking bootlegging situations to record these concerts, and now you can just whip out your phone and tape a whole concert at premium level yeah. on like a new iPhone, and no one, they, everybody just gave up. It was like, ah, fuck it. That's it. I think people were going, it's the same in schools. The question's so big and it came on so fast. It's like, well, what do we do about this? How is this going to affect these things that kind of need this space in order to thrive? You know, and what you said, that's cool for me to hear because it is for us. It's it, it's about the fan experience for sure. And just the energy in the room. But it's also about, it's about the artist. You know, if you look at what's going on from my perspective and like socially, culturally, it's super important that artists can step into a space, be genuinely uninhibited. Their jokes or whatever they want to experiment with musically or their material is not taken out of context. It's there and it's kind of, it's, it's interpreted in its full breadth, you know? So creating that space where it lives there and it can, they have the artist has the freedom to do it and that level of engagement with the fans is, even if it's only a two or three hour show, when people step into that and the information they're getting is being synthesized by an artist, it, to me, it's not what it's about, you know? Yeah. But what happens, I think, when people at a large show, everyone brings out their phone for one picture or for another. I mean, there's privacy standpoint for sure, and that's very important. But it's also like you just you poke a hole in the roof, and that leaves the room, and it, it's like a flight map, you know? It just goes, and it doesn't come back. So it doesn't have the chance, especially in a music show, it doesn't have the chance to bottle up and kind of grow and then crescendo, which for me is why you go to a show. Yeah, yeah putting together the ultimate set list yeah, that just, is building yeah. to this encore and uh, putting together a show. And, mm -hmm. and it's interesting to think about 
how people will just look at their screen. It's almost this weird insanity of like, oh, I don't want to just, because they can sit home and yeah. look at their screen all night. You can actually whip up an Instagram live and watch somebody at the show out from your couch. Mm -hmm. But they don't want to do that. They still want to be out with people, but not mingling with people, which is bizarre. Oh, I, uh, yeah. I That's mean, a weird thing. Well, it's like if you go to the shows you do, one of the things I always look for is you walk around the concession stands just before. And what are people doing? You know, people are talking more, which is great. There's more noise. But you see a lot of people the first five minutes or so who they have this gut reaction to reach for their pocket. You know, it's just an impulse. Oh, I, I and they go it. and you see it when they're talking and they go, oh, this is the time where I normally disengage. I grab my phone. Again, that's why it's a pouch is it kind of, their hand touches it and they go, oh yeah, phone free show. And it kind of forces people to re-engage with what they're doing. And to me, the issue in general of like how we get people to maybe stop living behind a screen, if we all think that's not a great idea, and I think we're all realizing that. Well, just experience it and let your body adjust. You know, it's pretty, it happens pretty naturally. Well, I, some of my best friends right now that I have for 30 years, I met at concerts. Yeah. And I'll tell you this, man, it's, uh, I wouldn't have these friends if I had a phone. Because, I, yeah, I fucking stare at my phone all day and night. A lot of it has to do with I've seen a million concerts, so mm -hmm. I'm kind of there oh yeah, this is cool looking at the phone or whatever. But yeah, I'm guilty of it too. And it's, it's really a, a, sta a strange feeling of being in a show again when your phone is locked away. It takes this weirdness of, uh, like you said, five, ten minutes of like, oh yeah, I'm here to see the show. Yeah. yeah that's wild. I don't have a problem at a movie, man. I, when I'm in there, I turn that fucker off. And I'm ready to engage with the movie. Yeah. And man, that is my great escape, you know? But concerts, it's weird. I remember all the concerts. People go, you got a great memory. I go, I do until the cell phone starts. Oh, that's interesting. And then I don't remember anything. You can't remember phone numbers. I can't remember where I saw the band or when or what songs they played. It's yeah. all a blur from like, I say 2006 ish mm -hmm. to now, you know, after the Blackberry, mm -hmm. the Blackberry was the first addiction. You're just emailing at, at the concert. You know, it didn't have a camera or whatever. People are like, your boss is hating you while you're at a stones concert for $500. Yeah. That was the first addiction. Crackberry. And then it just uh -huh. became this full-blown computer in your hand. Oh, exactly. And what is that? It comes with a lot of stuff. Oh. Having just a computer. Imagine, like, you and I grew up without them. But being 11 years old and, like, your world is mediated by this experience that's kind of the screen in front of you that's mediating your introduction to everything. It's, um, look, you can't put that genie back in the bottle, but... I think it's a good idea to give this generation the experience of what another path feels like, what yeah. it feels like to walk through a big show and you're just encountering things as you encounter them, you know, because it's, uh, yeah, I mean, you've seen it, the, the kind of outsourcing and it is well documented now how that oh, yeah. works in the neuro you know, neurological effects. But, um, like I said, I'm more interested in the cultural and like kind of the, what I see is an emerging counterculture, you know? Now, once you do the Dave shows, does he become an investor in it or what's going on there? Because I know he loves it. And, you know, and Dave and a lot of uh, my comedians, friends, and including myself, we we love the the privacy of trying to work jokes out without somebody just creating some small clip and going, this is what he said. It's like, yeah. well, actually, I'm trying to figure out this bit. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, you've never said anything weird your first time you're tr you're just trying to figure it out so without filming it and everything dave had to be like on board well he was the first artist that i met who he, he kind of instantly got it he was instantly got it and was like yes I, I think it was a couple years later that he ended up investing but when i talked to him about it and just what it represented where i thought things were headed and um, what it could do, he, he got it immediately. And for me, that was amazing because I think he's, I don't know, I think he's the best. Yeah, he's, he's great. He's the best out there. So, um, 
Yeah, he was the first. And then later on, you know, on the music side, people like Jack White. Yeah. It was really, it's cool to see kind of the artists we've worked with because there's definitely been a through line of kind of, I don't know, art, artists, artists, you know what I mean? Who are kind of in it for, have, represent something. Um, so that's kind of been the through line, I guess. But Dave was definitely the first person and, and also my introduction into a world I knew nothing about of comedy. And now I've seen, you know, hundreds and hundreds of shows and it's been amazing. When you guys start to do the Dave, or you do the Dave shows and then he says, I want to bring him on tour. Are you traveling just you and your buddy? Uh, it's a small company at the time and you're just, you know, are you on a plane or in a truck with the yonders or we would do whatever. Yeah. I mean, it was like, it's, well, Dave's so spontaneous with his shows anyways. Right. Like, we get a call and it's like, all right, there's a show in Grand Rapids. And it's like, you know, all right, well, the time maybe there are three or four of us. And it's like, well, somebody's hopping on a plane to go to Grand Rapids. Someone's taking about 10 check, check luggage and throwing every pouch we have into that and go in and someone else is talking to the venue and going all right here's how it's going to work because there's no protocols you know you're trying to explain to a venue this is how it's going to work and trust us it's going to work and they're like you know okay so you kind of we were all kind of tour managing at the time and just figuring it out and getting on the ground early and it was it was fun i mean we'd follow we'd do a you'd do a run through the the midwest or through the south and we would just kind of tail it somebody would be on it and then another artist would pop up and use us and it was like all right well i guess we need more pouches let's get a storage storage unit in downtown san francisco and get one in the public storage in la and toss stuff in the car and it was just completely like that how many bags you think you have now uh it's well into the millions now yeah wow yeah. millions yeah i think we'll do something like in 2022 and I don't know how much of this is pandemic related because, you know, the pandemic was bizarre for us, especially school shut down and shows shut down. But then as soon as it came back, there's been this huge accelerator effect, partly because I think people are so much more aware of the issue. And then show business has just gone, you know, like it's right. gone. But I think this year we probably will have done, I don't know, six or seven million seats wow. or so just in entertainment separate from schools. So it's a lot. That's crazy, yeah. dude. And is it the same people overseas making the bags, or did you have to switch, or did those guys go out of business? You know how that is. We've, we've moved around and tried to diversify. I mean, the only thing I knew from the very beginning, even when I made the fake Alibaba account, was it was probably a good idea to always have two or three horses in the race. Right. I figured that was just a good idea. So we've always kept a bit of that going. Did you copyright and get all that? I got that all buttoned up, patents and copyright and trademarks and stuff early on. So done everything pretty buttoned up way. Um, but yeah, I think we've also tried to just be easy to work with for right. artists and for promoters and stuff and, and venues especially and been like, hey, we're here to facilitate the show. That's our, that's always our message is, you know, it's not about yonder. It's about the artist doing a phone free show. So We've had been approached for you know a lot of things like hey why don't you do branding on the pouches oh, yeah. think about the amount of eyeballs you could get right oh yeah uh, and, oh um, yeah that's right advertising on those things right let's advertise and I, you know I'm like well it's not really about that it's about making the phone disappear in someone's pocket yeah it's not yeah you don't want it out the whole time Coors Light it's just not, Coors Light. Yeah. yeah it just it'd be yeah. chintzy you know what I mean it's like yeah. it's not and for our company we don't do any uh, we have no social media. We don't do any paid advertising. So it's like, it'd be against kind of the current of what we do. Yeah. Now the artist is the one that rents the bags, correct? Well, it really depends. It depends where in the life cycle, the tour planning and stuff we come in. It can be the artist. Sometimes it's a venue. It can be the promoter. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And then what does it usually run? It depends on the size of the yeah. tour and the run. It can be between, you know, two, three bucks, depending, but we provide all the labor, all the logistics and shipping. So depending on how something's routed and, you know, the labor market, everything moving around, supply chain stuff, that's that's kind of the range. But yeah. wherever it's possible, if it's like a bus tour or something, if it can go on the bus with them, fantastic. That Great. makes everything easier. Yeah. So we've learned a lot through the years about how to how to do that. And actually we've been kind of taught by experiences with really great band or kind of tour managers they've gone hey why don't you do this and we're like, great you know a lot more about that than we do so if let's say you're going on a tour an arena tour and you're doing like ten thousand seats a night 
and it can fit on the bus. So now the band's traveling with the Yonders, and then the employees of Yonder show up at each venue and run the whole thing, or how does this work? Yeah, exactly. We do all the advancing with the venues ahead of time. We'll go, all right, here's the, here's the, here's the, the routing for the tour. We'll advance with each venue, go, hey, here's, at this point too, we, we've worked with pretty much every venue in the country and a good number in Europe and Australia. So we're coming back now, which makes things a lot easier. And we'll say, all right, well, we know for this venue, we need X amount of staff to run the ingress and the egress. Okay, we'll set that up. You know, we'll use a combination of our full-time people, of our part-time people in every market. Because we need part-time people in all these markets also because we do, we won't just have shows coming through New York City. You know, we have hundreds of schools in New York City. And like right now, we're going into back to school. We need people to go in and we set them up kind of like a show, you know, to kick them off for the school year. So we'll use, we'll use our, we'll do the staffing and then we'll make sure the, the shipping gets around and everything's handled. Um, and then we'll pass on to the artist team to say, hey, here's some messaging that, that, that works and says, lets people know the important things. Hey, this is a phone free show. You're going to be able to keep your phone on you. That's really important. You can use it. Um, but then if the artist wants to do whatever they, they have a different message, that's totally fine. And we encourage them to do that. So when the artist goes out and it's like, you say about $3 a bag, let's say, are they buying the bags or renting them from you? Uh, renting. Rented. Yeah. So they rent the bags 30 grand a night. And let's say it's 10,000 seats. And then you provide the employees and they don't do anything. They just have the bags in the bus how does it work with damage? Do the bands have to pay for the damaged ones? No, we handle all that. We yeah. handle all that. We factor all that stuff in. And it's super variable. You know what I mean? It's like it's the day of the week. It's the city you're in. It's the artist for sure. Yeah. It's, uh, we'll, we'll go do shows in Australia or let's say it's a Scandinavia show. You won't have a pen mark on a single pouch. You right. Know? We do other ones. We did a show years and years ago. Like uh, maybe it was a Danzig show at the Forum oh, yeah. or something. Yeah. Oh. oh, Misfits, yeah. Oh, misfits, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, because they go no phones. And, I love it. And I was there, and it was a bloodbath. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was a bloodbath. And it's like, all right, well, now we know. So Wow. Yeah. You got to get Kevlar for those. We thought, I've thought about it, but it's like, I don't know. At the end of the day, it's still, it's about the, you know, getting people on the level, hopefully. There has to be a bit of a stick for sure. Hey, if you're seeing with the phone out, that's a problem. We're going to, the venue's going to do something, but... Our hope is still in, honestly, 90% of people are there. 90% of the people coming to shows, if you talk to them, go, hey, phone free show. Even even eight or nine years ago when we were starting out, people get it. People get that they're maybe on their phone too much and they want a break. It's just about approaching it in that way and hoping they're not too drunk. No, yeah. man. Yeah. 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 So uh, uh, it's wild to think about that they're in the schools. Isn't that crazy? that you gotta have them in the schools. And instead of just saying, hey, if your phone comes out, you're expelled. You know, like when I was young, if you just did anything, you were just kicked out of school. But every kid in there has a phone and you know, they gotta put them in a yonder bag now because the teacher can't be like, hey, no phones. They'll be like, ah, fuck you. You know, it's wild to think, right? Oh, it's, it's wild on a lot of levels in schools. It's the uh, kids growing up not knowing any difference. So they're, they're figuring it out. My sense has been that a lot of kids, they know something's out of whack with the way stuff's going, the pressure of social media and stuff. They don't know exactly what it is. They just know something feels off. So at that level, it's a, it's a very novel thing for them to go eight hours a day without a phone. But, but you're right. Discipline in a lot of schools is different than we were growing up. The rules, the way they're enforced, it, it all depends on the, the district you're in and the way it's set up. But it's a lot of similarities in a way to, to what we do in the show world. Like if an artist needs a certain degree of privacy in the public sphere, you know, to be uninhibited, the same way the fan deserves a certain amount of privacy to get a little too loose and not have it show up on YouTube. I think that should be people's right, more or less. Imagine you're, you're in school, you're in high school, you're at a school dance, or you're doing something embarrassing and it, somebody captures it. And it's online forever. Oh, so it's a whole other world, yeah. warped kind of world. Oh, people get de yeah. depressed. Like I'm, I'm over, yeah. and then they maybe suicide or whatever because some kids got a video of them doing something that's embarrassing. Right. Yeah, it's that's it's a wild world, man. It yeah. is, and it's all, 
it's the most brutal addiction I think there is, you know, because if you got a heroin addiction or coke, you might die from fentanyl or whatever. But for the most part, people don't die from the phone unless they're texting and driving. So they, it takes them a long time to realize they've got some problems. Yeah, I think it, yeah, it slowly kind of warps. I think people's perspective maybe because you know, a lot of you know whether it's the news or pop culture or whatever. A lot of people I think are ingesting a lot of things that are disembodied online, you know, and uh, then regurgitating those ideas. But they don't really walk around for a day or two in those ideas, try them on for size, bounce them off some friends while you're having a beer, like sound them out a little. So then people get really kind of um, these blocks of associations or whatever, and they bump up against things, and it's hard to navigate. Whereas when you're in person, a lot of that rounds out because you, you're forced to moderate a little more. You, you have to deal with what you say. It has consequences, it, all that stuff. So all that, is, for younger people especially, I think it, it has to be kind of learned and developed, not to mention, I mean, is looking things up on the Internet quickly and retrieval, is that critical thinking? Like. Yeah, I don't think so. So it's a muscle that's got to be flexed, you know? Yeah, you never use your brain anymore, you know? Like, that's my thing now. I'm always like, what was the name of that? Instead of going for the draw, you know, the immediate, like, phone and looking it up, I just think for a while. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. I'll tell you something weird that happened to me a couple of days ago. I was just laying in bed, and my high school combination, locker combination, oh. came to me. 29, 13, 32. Out of nowhere. That's amazing. I was like, why did that pop up in my brain? About a year ago, my first car's license plate popped up. Hmm. You know? And it's funny that because I knew that because back then when you used a credit card, mm -hmm. you'd have to go inside. And then, you know, for a gas card, I had a Shell card or Chevron. Back when they had their own and you'd have to give the guy your license plate number. Mm -hmm. So it's funny to think about how your memory works so good and nobody's memory works anymore at all. You know, going back to what I said before, I don't really remember a lot of the shows I've seen over the last, since 06. You know, I know, oh yeah, I've, I've seen these bands, but I can't really remember much about it. <laughs> oh, totally. I mean, yeah, I guess you, if you're, if you don't have a computer or whatever, the way you think about things, you have to build some structure of knowledge. You know, things have to be connected and related. Like, you want to go to a library to find something about chimpanzees, you, you got to go to mammals, you primates. If you go on the internet to look for chimpanzees, the first link is a chimp ripping someone's face off. You yeah, know, it, it's, yeah. All, it's all flat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's like, what is that? How do you hold on to that? Yeah, you know, yeah. It, it's something. Yeah. It's I don't. Know, it's kind of in the nature of the internet, I guess, and. Um, I think we're just collectively wrestling with how to how to navigate it. Yeah, uh, I, I do uh, appreciate the. Uh, it seems to have gotten faster these days. Me being an artist out there and waiting for the people to get in the room uh, seemed to be a long wait for a while. Mm -hmm. And when you're doing two shows in a night, it really had an effect. But the last few shows I've been doing. Uh, I noticed that there was people right in the aisle as you were coming out, mm. opening your bag, you know, to get them out of the venue quicker and the other people in quicker, which is uh, way better. And I also think it comes down to how many employees you got at the theater or the arena, you know, to get them locked up. Definitely. The space. I mean, we've learned a ton through, through, through time. So I think it's taken... You know, we're still improving, honestly, how we do it. But yeah, little things like that and every venue being different, the layout being different. I think we've tried to keep things, keep improving, keep things getting quicker and quicker. So that's a big, that's a big push for us in the next year or so. How many uh, people at Yonder now, employees wise? I was between 60 and 70 full time, maybe. Wow. And then, yeah. Just think it's you and your buddy out there bagging up Chappelle's phones and now you got 60, 70. Yeah. Are yeah. they traveling with tours or is that what they're doing? Well, we've got, you know, a lot of the team, when we talk about tours, those are kind of tour managers that we hire and bring on, uh, and either part-time or full-time. Then we have an internal production team that handles all the, the infrastructure for shows, you know. We've got an artist relations team who, you know, we talk with agents and managers and artists and, and do that side. And then there's a whole other side of the business, which is just around schools 
and the other spaces we do because we're also in we're in courts we're in warehouses we work with mining facilities for worker safety we're driver fleets we're, we're in all different kind of stuff um, but the two pillars of the company are definitely around education and, and artists live performance wow i think it would be a good uh, good thing too around uh outlaws you know like uh you know mob and stuff hey man you gotta put that phone in a in a bag, he, you know, like, like old Soprano style. He's wearing a wire. You know? Hey, hey, we get used for all sorts of private events and stuff that. Yeah, yeah. People yeah. want privacy. I, I get it. Oh you yeah, know? especially with how much tracking and eavesdropping goes on these days. Oh my God! You right? Know? What's the name yonder? Oh, I think it's. Is just it more, over yonder? Is that what it's? It kind of comes from that. Yeah, it kind of it's just it's really simple. The idea of like you know what's going on over yonder you have to be there to know you know just kind of the feeling it, it gives you yeah how old are you 35 35 yeah you hit it man right you hit it in the tech world everybody's looking for something and everybody would be like ah i can't believe i didn't think of that you oh, know no, i've been to comedy yeah. clubs uh where they just use kind of a fedex type of sealed bag anything uh works it helps you know if somebody can get something away from them, you know, but, uh, yeah, you definitely, you can't, you got, you hit something. Anybody try to buy it from you yet? Oh, I, I'm not really interested to be honest. Yeah. I think there's nothing else I'd rather be doing. So it's like, well, what would I, you know, in the tech world, I was, I was in San Francisco for a long time and uh, the tech world is a lot of it's so silly to me. It's yeah. so, so derivative and people just kind of, I don't know. It just kind of whatever. So for me, it was actually a great benefit because we're there we are kind of in the belly of the beast and i'm looking at all these people sending out sitting behind a screen sending out surveys and doing a bunch of engineers designing how people are going to interact socially which is probably not a good idea anyways the social platforms and i was like all right well the way things are headed i just see things going a very different direction so it was interesting to be there and watch it but in terms of the startup world and that kind of thing the vc back I, I, we, we've stayed away from that just it doesn't level with kind of how we want to grow Who's some of the big big acts you have right now? You, uh, I'm out on the Bill Burr Arena tour, so that's uh, how I got a hold of you to do this. And, and you know, I've I've loved the uh, Yonder bags, but and then Chappelle mm -hmm. and Jack White, of course. I know. And is Tool using them? I don't think so at the moment. Yeah, Tool yeah. was a big big no phone, I but know. they were going on. You know, please just put them away. Yep. And asking over and over. And I remember I saw Tool and there was like Usher. It's like, hey, no phone. I was like, wow, that's got to be a brutal job for an Usher, you know? I think that's tough. I've heard that oh. from a lot of venues. The Ushers are like, that's just, that's yeah. a rough spot to be. The oh. same way it's rough for a teacher 40 times a day to have that same conversation. Yeah. That's kind of, that's exactly it. You just go crazy as a yeah. teacher. Like, Timmy again no phone and you know with kids too it's social media and video games oh 100%. oh my god i don't even know how they're even learning anything and also i can't even believe in this era of like school shootings and craziness that there are schools anymore because we all have computers at home <laughs> yeah and it's like look my whole life i hated school and loved it I loved going to be around my friends yeah. all day and just talking, you know, dude, I saw Van Halen last night, you know, and all that. But, it, you know, it's, it's interesting that there are even schools anymore with the computers, how incredible they are, you know. And you only yeah. really need to learn one skill in life, I think, now. It's either computers or you're going to do arts or some kind of trade, mm -hmm. you know building computers working on computers or construction people that's really what this life is now you know computers fix the cars mm -hmm. computers you know it's it's a weird world so uh, it's wild i think that people go to school still for the one two threes abcs you know oh i hear you. it's a and a lot of schools have or one-to-one -one, you know with laptops so they're doing quite a bit of the curriculum on the on the screen but it's probably the social thing, like you talked about. Yeah. It's more important than anything else. I think so. You know, it's just yeah. being there around other kids. You got to be around people. You, you got to be around people. Or else you're just all going to be like just these weird, weird, antisocial, like uh, introverts that don't know how to communicate. You know, people don't know how to communicate now. I do find that once the bags are in the yonder, 
people take a few minutes like, oh, I got to talk to the guy next to me. You know? It's definitely a bit of an uh, adjustment. Yeah. Um, it takes it takes a few minutes, I've noticed, for people to kind of click into that other gear, have a drink or two, simmer down and be like, okay. But you need that. You yeah. need that to kind of like keep that muscle memory going. Otherwise, it's too... Online makes it just too easy to be there. And when things get a little difficult, I'm out. awkward. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, text. Also, right online toughies. Oh, yeah. Hey, go fuck yourself. Now yeah. you don't got any online. <laughs> I'm, not so, I'm not so tough, you know? Oh, that's, yeah. The, the whole, the phantom, the yeah. phantom public, everyone yeah. and no one, you know? Yeah. So what do we got? We got like Dave, we got uh jack white we have uh burr who else is out yeah, there joe rogan yep. uh bob dylan dylan um, okay. yeah he's big on that yeah that's been that's been really cool to see you ever talked to dylan about it face to face i haven't actually talked to his team at all wow which i'd like to it's yeah. just it's gotten to the point honestly where we have we've gotten big enough that it's kind of hard for me to keep track of everything happening yeah um but I'll, hopefully i'll catch part of his run coming up yeah dylan um, who else Oh, there's a bunch. I'm going to miss people. Yeah. You already mentioned Dave, Jack, Amy Schumer, uh, Joe Rogan. I think Aziz, when he's out, we do. Um, who are the other people in the comedy world? Kevin Hart. Oh, yeah. Uh, Chris Rock. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot. And then How we about constant, music? On the music side right now, I think it's Jack White. It's um, Bob Dylan. I think we have another two European bands coming up that I can't name yet. Yeah. Um, and then we work with, oh, Silk Sonic. We do out in, uh, which is a great show. We watch that out in uh, Vegas. And then we're doing more stuff in Vegas that are around residencies too, oh. which is music related. Yeah, that's great because yeah. then the stuff just stays there. Exactly. And the band's there for like three weeks, like Aerosmith. And then they just have the yonder bags. It's great. Yeah, just make it something that they can do and make it yeah. really easy with the venue because it's just plug and play, you know? I saw Bruce Springsteen on Broadway when he's doing the Broadway run. Yeah. And he came out and he said, well, before he came out, they had the big, you know, please, absolutely no phones. And Broadway, pretty much 99% of the people respect it. You'll get the, you know, couple of dummies you know, I was sitting next to these like Jersey women, like, oh, fuck them, man. You don't tell me. I'm going to film some Bruce, you know, whatever. It's like, oh, God. But Bruce did something amazing. At the end of the show, he goes, all right, I'm going to stand here for a couple minutes. Everybody get your photo. And people lit up the photos, and then, you know, okay, we're done with that. Because there is an interesting thing now. Back when I was young, you couldn't bring a camera into a concert yeah. at all. You had to, I, I've got a ton of photos from concerts. I snuck in an Instamatic. But one thing I do notice, which is weird, uh, as a, uh, an up, uh, you know, uh, a newer comic, I almost said up and coming, but you know, a newer comic, there's this weird a uh, medium of where the people get a photo of you during the show and they put it up on Instagram and it really helps promote me when I'm out on the road. And I notice on the whole bird tour, there's just no, it's a ghost tour, yeah. which is wild. It's like, did the tour even happen? We yeah. just did 40 dates and there's no photos of it at all. <laughs> wow, it's a trip. It, it is it, a, trip. a trip. And a lot of artists, especially in the early going, that was the thing we heard, you know, it'd be like, ah, oh, we, we want the social media exposure. Right. You know? Okay. But some of the artists we've worked with, and I think Jack's team does this, you know, they, they have professional photographers or videographers. They take their own stuff and then make that available to all the fans afterwards, yeah. which I think is a great idea great. to kind of still get that, but then maintain that all the stuff we talked about, about the space, you know, because you really can't have both in terms of the full flight of the constant wave of social media throughout the show. But yeah, in the world but, of the yeah. selfie, people are tortured. They're like, man, I, I went to see Jack White. They're like, well, I know you didn't. I didn't see any photos on your Instagram. Exactly. Well, here's one of me outside. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is a, it is a, uh, that's a good point. I always try to make a, a, a point to get a photo at each venue. Also, for memories when i'm home i'm like oh my god look at these venues we just did you know as an artist to 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 get it out there and let people know we're out there doing it but yeah it's it's 
It's I, I, I think the yonder bag is a 99% win for me. Uh, like I said, it really comes down to the staff being able to get these people in quick. Because if you're the opener like myself, yeah, or any opening band or opening comedian and there's yonders, you're going to be fucked because the people are coming in way slower than they were in the uh, old days, you know, or non yonder show, you know, so you're playing to a half room or a quarter room. That's Mm -hmm. the only bummer I see of yonder. Other than that, if the room is full, boy, they are on board and engaged. Well, that's cool to hear. I think we're going to keep trying to work on with venues on maybe sometimes opening doors a little earlier, getting people because also, Depending on the show, people show up at, it's shocking to me sometimes, people are there like very late, but... Oh man, they show up like yeah. uh, 10 minutes after the doors. It, it's, it's so weird. It's they think it like, oh, they're not going to start on time. All concerts start on time now. Oh yeah. There's a thing called union. There's people that have babysitters. We know they got to be home by 1130. We're not going to be going on an hour and a half late, you know? This isn't GNR 90s. It's like we're yeah. going on and we have another show tonight, you know? Exactly. <laughs> but the, to, to hear that it, you pick up on the difference, that's for us. That's honestly, oh. that's what it's about. It's like, because that's the perspective we don't have, is what you see. You're on stage. You, you, I, I figure you guys are more attuned than anybody to what's going on in the room, oh, what yeah. you're picking up on. And like, that's my hope is everyone leaves the show and goes, whatever they think about Yonder. Some people really love it, some people, eh, whatever. But hopefully everyone goes, that was a great show. Yeah. If, if we're doing that and we're helping the artists do that, then to me, we're, like, we're doing our job. I love the Yonder Bag. I mean, as a comedian, I think it's the greatest thing that ever happened because there's just nothing worse than doing bits and people are just staring at their phones. Because these people, they pay big money and they're, they're looking at their phones. It's crazy to me. I'm like, wait, didn't you just buy a ticket and pay to park and gas and maybe a babysitter and a couple drinks and stuff and you're not going to watch it. And comedy is so brutal. If people don't hear the setups, yeah. you're missing. You could be like, man, I'm bombing. No, you're not bombing. They're just not hearing half the jokes, which is a wild move. Absolutely. It, people have to be tuned in for sure. In yeah. comedy, especially like if you're not following the thread then you're not going to get it when the punchline comes. Oh, not at all. Yeah. Not You'll see all. people up in the front row with big acts, like doing just on the front. It's, oh, man. It's whatever. What, uh, where are you living now? I'm over just in Mar Vista. Oh, yeah. yeah so you're down, down south here. Yeah. We moved, uh, we moved down during, just during COVID, like a year ago. Yeah. So it's trying it on for size. It's Great. Beach life, but it's good. And uh, what do you got coming up for Yonder? Anything different or just more of what you're doing and try to get more tours? I mean, back to school is going to be super busy for us. So, oh, yeah. I mean, we're how doing, many schools do you think you got? I don't know. We're in the several thousand now. Wow. So, and that's in private the, yeah. schools? Mostly public. Well, public, wow. Yeah, mostly public. And um, I mean, we do schools here. Australia is a big market for us. We have a lot of schools in Europe and the UK and Ireland. So, back to school is going to be super busy. We'll be doing that. Then it's, it's more tours. And then, you know, we're going to start planning again for. Um, we did a, our own festival this past June in upstate New York. Foam, you did? Yeah, Foam Free Music Festival. Wow. Um, so we'll start planning for next year. Who played that? So, uh, I think one of the headliners was Chick, Chick, Chick. But we had a little bit of everything scattered through. Yeah. Um, but it's cool. I mean, it's it's three days. People, we kind of do this. You know, we get a bunch of furniture, antique furniture and stuff. So kind of like an outdoor house party, really, in a big field. Yeah. And just do that for three days and everyone's everyone's off the grid and... Um, and then we do a bunch of team trips. So like usually every year we'll go to do a team trip to Joshua tree. And actually like when the pandemic hit, we were on our team trip for three or four days in Joshua tree camping. So nobody knew that the pandemic had, we, we all got back on the grid. We kind of floated into Palm Springs or whatever. And everyone's like, Tom Hanks has COVID. Yeah. And so everyone just, just departed. Probably yeah. half the team had COVID cause we're all just yeah. camping for a week. And didn't see each other all together for another year and a half. But wow, um, we do stuff like that. We try to, as a team, like get around. There's a cool show coming up. Maybe it's Fenway for Bill. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Is there like a little focal point where the team can all gather and work the show, a good portion of us, and then have some fun? Like we'll do that. And I think we're going to keep doing more of our own shows yeah. also where we can kind of bring in cool up and coming artists, hopefully. And um, 
Yeah, there's just a lot of, we have a lot of different stuff cooking, but it's exciting for us. Shout out to Club Soda Kenny for uh, g- getting this uh, together for me because he's like, this would be a good guess. I was like, it, I, it would be. We got to do this, you know? So he's a uh, Burr's tour manager, okay. which is really cool to, because uh, I love to have stuff like this. And I also always love to, um, you know, open people's eyes that are always like, fuck that. Mm-hmm. And it's like, eh, I don't know. Maybe you become a performer and see what it's like to stare at faces uh, looking at phones, you know? I was, uh- it's great to hear your perspective, yeah. honestly, because that's yeah, what yeah. it's about. And yeah. it's helpful. Hopefully people understand where it's coming from. We're not trying to be punitive. It's a, hopefully right. people see it as freeing. Because to me, the least freeing thing nowadays is this feeling like an ant under a microscope with cameras everywhere and, you know. Oh, God. Yeah. The electric eye, as Judas Priest would sing about back in the day. Hey, it's, <laughs> you know? it's what it is. You yeah. Know? So we kind of hopefully step into a space at a show and it's like you're stepping into a, a national park for a while. You know, it's yeah. it exists for some other purpose. It's not economic. You're here to see a show. Well, thanks for doing the show, man. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thanks yeah, for having me. Yeah, it was me. great, and yeah. uh, I I love I love talking yonder, and and I just really love comedy clubs that take the initiative to make the show better. Wendy at the Comedy Works, you know, she saw it right away and was like, "This is a must," and. There's so many bad comedy club owners out there where the the show is just a shit show and they're not throwing anybody out or anything because they want to sell those drinks. Yeah. And, you know, they don't care about you up there. It's like, hey, don't worry about that. They don't they don't police the room or there's not enough employees to police the room or it gets weird. And there's too many people on the phone. And after a while, they're telling the people all to turn off their phones. And then the show is just a shit show. So the clubs like Wendy at the Comedy Works and uh, I know the Hollywood Improv. I don't know if they still had them. Have Mm -hmm. them. They had them for a while. Um, These clubs, it just makes a difference to all of us. And the comics talk, man. Comics are like, God, it's so great to have that, you know. Uh, especially if you're shooting a special yeah oh my god no phones you know so oh, thank yeah. you man no absolutely and P, you're right people like wendy they're uh, they're super cool people they're with it she's jumped on it right away she's awesome and yeah. you're right hopefully it becomes a thing where comics feel more comfortable performers feel more comfortable yeah. you know being in a phone free space i hope it i hope it gets into movie theaters man yeah you know because I think the movie theater is one of the worst um, worst offenders of it. You know, when you're in the movie theater, everyone's on their phone. Yeah, it's crazy. I can't, they can't go two hours or an hour and a half without their phone. It, it is wild to me. So the movie theater, you know, they're suffering in a lot of ways. You've got some really insanity in a movie theater. You fucking maybe shooters. You got talkers and you got texters, mm-hmm. and and you know the movie business is down. A lot of it has to do with COVID. They're trying to bounce back and everything, but you know, I would pay a dollar more a ticket to go to a, a yonder bag movie. Uh, that's just what I would do. Point me in the right direction. I'll talk to someone. I know. You right? Tell me yeah. who to talk I mean, to. I mean, yeah. yeah, we got to get the big movie chains. You know, yeah, whoever they are, but. I mean, that's just me. I, I think movies, uh, films are just such a, a, a big piece of art and an escape, you know? Yeah. Just going in and seeing a, a film and, and coming out going like, wow, I went somewhere, mm-hmm. you know? So, yeah, hopefully movie theaters uh, adopt this big time, you know? I think I think we might have one or two film festivals lined up for this year oh, coming yeah. up, yeah. this next year, and... I feel the same way. What you said, when you go somewhere and you come back and you go, I went somewhere, that's it. That's live performance. That's films. That's that's what it can do for people, which I, I hope is kind of antidote to what you said before, people sitting on the couch watching the simulation of the thing. Yeah. Because that has the way of, that's like a downward trajectory. Yeah, totally. That's just like not, yeah. that's not it, I don't think. <laughs> nope. Yeah. Well, thanks for doing the show. Uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in to The Grail. And don't forget to subscribe and leave a review on iTunes and YouTube. It greatly appreciates, uh, greatly helps the show, and I greatly appreciate it. 
And uh, like I said, you know, you get out to those uh, comedy shows with the Yonder Bag. It's, it's going to be a better experience for you. You guys are, are definitely going to remember that show. And uh, thanks, everybody. See you next time.